This is the Ben Shear Golf Podcast, where we will be talking science, fitness, and everything golf performance. Welcome to the Ben Shear Golf Podcast. Uh, awesome day here today. I have my buddy Sean Foley joining me. Uh, Sean and I have known each other a long time. We work together on an advisory board down at Core Golf Academy, spend time together out on the tour. Uh, I can certainly go through all of the accolades and the recognition Sean has gotten over the last bunch of years. Please, 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 please don't. <laughs> <laughs> but not needed because I'm sure many of you know who Sean is, what Sean has done and accomplished. Uh, he's done an amazing job out there on tour with a lot of young players, you name it. So, Sean, just welcome to the show, and we'll skip through that. Everybody knows who you are. Well, the, the thing is, though, that Kevin Chappell, uh, who's a friend of mine, he, 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 was, uh, he was inducted into the UCLA Sports Hall of Fame, right? Yep. And so I talked to him before he got it, and he goes, you know, uh, I don't think I'm very good at being honored. <laughs> Yeah. And I, and I said and I said Chap and that's why I love you, bud. <laughs> yeah, it's an uncomfortable position. It is. Well, I mean, it's it's just the th the thing is I think I think that um Jay-Z did an interview like a few years ago and they were like they were giving him accolade after accolade after accolade and he said the thing is you don't understand is I'm not humble. I just I still feel like I'm behind in my own mind. So anybody who's trying to push the envelope or influence a paradigm in you know in the way that we have over the last decade um you know i'm very fortunate i think as a golf coach because my biggest influences have been strength and conditioning coaches and physios and chiros and osteos and doctors of chinese medicine so it's just i mean the amount of time that you guys have seen me sit in the gym with you when i've got you know two hours off or i'm waiting for davies or one of those guys i mean I've been in some of the most forward thinking conversations ever, just sitting there like a bug on the wall, um, taking it, taking it all in, yeah. um, you yeah. know, so that's the, to, to me, the, the role of a coach is really trying to basically influence or convince someone that they can become a better version of, of the player they are. And, and in my case, um, I like to look at the person as well, not to say that I have an idea of how a person should be, um, but you know, the, the, those, 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 uh, those types of things. So for me, it's not about trophies and FedEx cup and all that stuff. As we can see at this time right now, um, you know, it's uh, what's essential. And to me, what's essential is I'm sitting there on the range with Danny Willett this morning and uh, down here in Orlando and he's hitting some balls, and we were talking about what some of the players have been saying, like they're, they're challenged to go out and practice because they don't feel like there's anything that they can aim for. And I said to Danny, I go, well, you know, we base all of what we do off of mastery, so this doesn't matter, does it? And he was like, you're right. Yeah. And so we just, we just that, keep repping, right? Yeah, I had that same conversation with my players over the last couple of days. I said, look, this is an opportunity, and not everybody is going to step up and take it. They're going to be guys who sit on the couch and be like, oh, I have time or whatever it is. I don't have to push myself. And I said, look, that's great. I hope that everybody doesn't do that because we're not going to take that approach. We're going to keep pushing. We're going to keep, you know, trying to improve and we're going to try to be our best selves, whatever that may mean. And hopefully when we all kick back into gear, that's going to reap benefits for us. And that should be what we all do in life every day, no matter what your profession, whatever you are. It's like, hey, we all have highs and lows in life. But what, defi 100%. what defines you is what you do in those low moments. Everybody is a great superstar, does the right thing, blah, 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 when they're in the high moments. It's what you do when you're in the low that defines you, in my opinion. Yeah, I think even that word, you know, like you could say, if you wanted, if you wanted to reframe the, the, the word low, um, there would be high moments and there would be growth moments. And I, I just sure. think that enough people, people don't connect the dots uh, I think growth has too many negative synonyms that probably aren't synonyms in the thesaurus. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, it, fuck, it is what it is, dude. You know, if you're three over through four, you, you, you know, there's going to be some who sit there for the next two holes thinking about, I work so hard, I can't believe this has happened to me, and, and make two more bogeys versus someone who knows that they've got 14 holes left um, to do uh, to accomplish great things or or learn from 
uh, things that weren't accomplished. <laughs> oh, for sure. So let's dig in. Let's dig into golf a little bit here. So I, I think why you and I have always gotten along is I think we have a lot of commonalities and kind of a the way we try to think about things and b the things we're interested in. Right? We both love how the body works, the golf swing, biomechanics, ground forces, all all of this cool stuff, the psychology of the player, you name it. But to me, I mean, and again, my bias is the body because I'm a body guy. But to me, when I look at things like 3D and force plates and track man, you name it, those are just telling me what I do. They're not telling me why I do it. They're telling me what I do. And it's great technology and can be an important part of our process. But to me, the body often tells you why you're seeing what you're seeing on those technologies. And if it's not, and if the body doesn't tell you why, at least then it also tells you, hey, the body's not the issue as to this. This may be a purely technique issue or whatever the case may be. Obviously, a guy like yourself who studied this a lot, I mean, you even sat in lectures that I teach on biomechanics, sadly for you. Um, but, you know, what do you think for the average golf teacher, just not even average, for any golf teacher or any golfer out there, like of all this cool stuff, because we get inundated with technology and workouts and swing theories and you name it, like, what do, you, what do you see as the most important thing to understand first that ultimately drives you down the path of success? Uh, I would probably say because I, obviously the body is the first answer in my head, but if I, if I, if I deep dive a little bit more, a lot of people – who are going to come to you and, and help, uh, and, and help, you know, build your business. It's not going to matter if Mrs. Jones has 45 degrees of internal hip rotation, she can't get out of bunker. Right. So it's, you don't really need hip rotation perfectly to get a ball out of a bunker. You just need to have an idea of how to hit a bunker shot. So I would say to me, pretty much two things, everything from 30 yards in, Okay. Um, will be when I think about like I I still play and the guys I play with are anywhere from scratch to twelve or fifteen, right? Yeah. I just I just play with people I like to hang out with. I, I'm not really I'm not out there like I'm not out there grinding over a uh, five footer. Yeah, trying um, to have some fun. Man, I mean, they don't even want to they don't even want to know about the short game stuff because they're making so much money as a fifteen. <laughs> they all hit it deep, like they all slice it about the same every I mean they're almost more consistent than pros they slice it every time consistently they always bad. come up <laughs> they all yeah they, they always come up at least one and a half club short um but the, the thing is though to me is where they would be make massive gains wouldn't be doing a swing overhaul it why do we play golf like that's what you know that's what social media and all that stuff is affected in golf instruction um you know it's it's a it's affected people's idea that that we play golf to shoot a lower score it's not to look perfect at p5 in some posed picture on your account you know what i mean like that's not what it is it's about shooting a lower score so if if everyone had their players 15 to 25 handicap come each time with only their wedges and their putter they would be making they'd be improving their business because People don't like getting beat by their friends. All of a sudden, they're getting beat every time. Well, what's going on? I'm taking short game lessons. Um, boom, there's your business. My business didn't get bigger because people were perfect at P7. Um, it's such a silly way to think about things. It, they got better because they were shooting lower scores, period. Yeah, yeah. look, that's their kids were Their, no their kids were getting scholarships. Their kids were getting scholarships because they um, – we're shooting lower scores. So that, and then from a technical standpoint, um, just straight up ball flight laws, straight up. But if, if you don't understand when the club, you know, when the flat surface is a round object, why it's doing what it's doing, it's going to be very difficult from there. Some people have an intuitive sense um, about it. Um, I know plenty of people who thought that the ball started with the path and curve with the face. A lot um, of great teachers, great teachers. Right, who coach guys to number one in the world. So sure. they might not have been able to – they knew it, but they didn't know it. Like it, So, you know, I think it's important at this time to not continue to spread that as an idea. Um, 
Do you know what I mean? And, and to be honest with you, if I'm a player and I'm going to hit a draw, it does feel like I'm, you know, I definitely feel like the ball's starting more right because I'm swinging more right. I know that's not the case, but it certainly feels like that. So yeah. I, mean, I know what for me, I remember what, talking with Webb Simpson one day and saying to Webb, hey, you know, what do you do different when you hit a draw versus a fade? He's like, well, I don't know. I just think draw or I think fade and the ball does it. Right. Obviously, he's changing something. It's not he didn't have uh, telepathic powers that made the ball go, the ball go in different directions. But like you say, there's players, there are people who have instincts for this and just know how to do it and don't even know why. Yeah, yeah he's he, he you know he he's just basically you know whereas a coach will say he's applying a torque here at P six. It's like guys, I get that. Like who doesn't understand that? The, the, it's just like we're not we're not supposed to be doing. I'm not supposed to come and see Ben Shear for a workout and leave just absolutely overwhelmed with information. I mean, yeah, you're smart. I get it. That's great. But I, I need to, I need to know in, in the, the, the most simple term. Now I'm not afraid to go uh, cognitively challenge myself, but the thing is, dude, is most people who come to see us, they don't speak the lingo that we speak. So we have to be like really careful on how we're going about doing it. And in my estimate, I feel like I'm always being understood more than I am. If I stop in the lesson and go, do you get it? What am I talking about? And they're like, I'm not really sure, coach. And I'm like, oh, God, what am I doing out here? Right. Yeah, communication is a huge piece of all of this. So that's good stuff. So, yeah, you, you, just, ha you just have to feel like, you know, you just always have to feel like you're not doing a good enough job, man. I mean, I still – it's like this – it's like this insecurity that's really necessary and responsible. Yeah, I mean, um, we all have that. I think all of us who have been successful have this doubt in ourselves all the time where we like, yeah, there's so a part I mean, of us that I mean, thinks, oh, I've learned a lot because we have put so much time into it. And you feel like, and you see the results that your player may get. But at the same time, like, if, you know, you're going to put be put to the test. You're kind of always looking at yourself like, am I actually right? Am I getting lucky? Like, you kind of like, like, am, yeah, I, am, oh, I, am I, I mean, more lucky than smart? You know, and, you know, you, you, I ask myself those questions all the time. And, you know, obviously there's look, it's, it, yeah. certainty. People, people who are certain scare the shit out of me. <laughs> um, cer certainty really freaks me out. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, so basically from a combination of growing up uh, in the golf machine and then uh, John Jacobs, uh, Ernest Jones, uh, Jim Flick, uh, Bob Tosky, kind of what I would say were my main influencers when I started teaching for a living. Yeah. Um, I was lucky that when I met Stephen Ames and Sean O'Hare and Hunter Mahan and Justin Rose that they kind of all needed similar things, and those things were like my belief system. Right. So – when Tiger came to me, uh, those same things didn't fit uh, the, in the way that I needed it to. And so, it, you know, that's the, that's the whole idea is that it's just understanding, like, at one point I had a belief system that was a certain way. So I have to remind myself right now I have a belief system that's a certain way. And if you think about belief systems – if you wanted to, you could completely challenge every belief system is not accurate. So it's it's uh, it's just always like continuously trying to learn, continuously trying to, you know, be able to make it more simple by understanding the complexities of it and just never really sit there and hold your hat on. It's this because it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, I think that's an interesting I, I kind of often when I teach or lecture, I, I give an example. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in what you just said about beliefs and how powerful beliefs are, right, and why people have their beliefs. They've spent money on taking classes or they've spent time studying or there's somebody they trust and respect has told it to them or whatever. Or, or, they're, or, they're, or they're brainwashed as kids, right? Yeah, yeah whatever, whatever it is, yeah. The parents, their religion, and we can go, we can go down all of the different paths that put you yeah. there, right? And yeah, I always say to people, path. yeah, and I said if I drew a, a table on a board, and I wrote whatever your belief is on, on as the on top of the on top of the table, and, and then I say to you, say to you, give me why you believe what you believe, the support, the legs that hold up your table, and then if I said, well, if I can knock your legs out from under your table, will you change your beliefs? And the answer is most people will not, right? And I think that very few people could put up a table that people can at least at minimum put into question the legs that support that belief system. Not saying sure. because the other viewpoint might be equally arguable, but it certainly means that those legs are shaky at best. And I don't think there are many legs 
on any table that are so definitive as a lot of people like to say they are. No, dude, 100%, it's hard. It's just not easy. I mean, we're sitting there a, a year ago, and Justin Rose is number one in the world, and now we're number 13, and I've been with him the whole time. And so when people are like, well, what were you doing when you – well, it, it's not that different. It's like, you know, it's – I mean, we had this this time where he had like 27 top tens and 33 starts at 38, 39 years old. I mean – that's some of the most special golf we've seen in the last two decades. Sure. I just it's can't just hard. Look, really again, put my... there's intangibles. The you know the, the... oh so many. <laughs> how, how did he sleep? How is his other life outside of golf? Maybe nothing changed. Maybe somebody else played better. How do you know? You have no idea what happened to the other people. Are they? Are you actually still the same? And they've improved. And you you're the same. I mean, we have no idea how to quantify or measure that stuff. I mean, unless something fundamentally broke down, which obviously with Rosie, that has not happened. Yeah, yeah, 100%. No, no, it's just – and so that's the thing. It's like, you know, when I see coaches and their players are playing well and they have, like, a little more of a bravado about them, I'm like, man, don't do that. Don't <laughs> just be, 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 super, be super grateful uh, and then get ready to hunker in. I mean, the fact is we're all – you know, so many people, they want to get to the summit, but, dude, they don't want frostbite at 20,000 feet. Now, I'm sorry, at 20,000 feet, we're all going to get frostbite. Yeah, look, I mean, I've been up there with players, world number one, major champions, and then as quick as it came, it's gone, right? And it's like, obviously, you did something right, and maybe you did something wrong. Maybe you didn't do something wrong. Again, uh, the the person's no, individual yeah, psychology, you did all of it. how they handled the moment of being at the top or didn't handle the moment of being at the top, how they, you know, look, there's the human element, I'll call it, is too complex for us to be able to just say, okay, this is the problem. And we try to obviously do that. And we try to find out at least if there are elephants in the room that you can improve on. But in general, to be able to look at the human element and say, this one thing is what changed it, often is very, very, very almost impossible to do. Yeah, no, the – that's the, the that the mystery is what can, the mystery is why we continue to wake up, buddy. Exactly. So let's do this. We're gonna take a quick break, and then we're gonna come back. And I want to talk about team because I know you're a big team guy with your players, both with your junior program. Do you want to take your body and game to the next level? Do you want to get a program from the best in the business, the same way tour players do, but don't have access to the finances to do it? Finally, Ben Shear Golf is offering various online training options for players just like you. Now you too can have access to the best golf fitness has to offer online and at a price you can afford. For more information, go to our website, www.bensheargolf.com to learn more. That is www.bensheargolf.com, S-H-E-A-R to spell sheer. Welcome back. Here with my man, Sean Foley, talking, I don't know what we're talking about. We're talking about golf. We're talking about life. Exactly. We're talking about, you know, and there really is probably not much difference between the two. It's all kind of intertwined. And when you think that they're not and that people can truly compartmentalize one piece versus the other, I think you're missing the boat. So we are dealing with the humans. Uh, but within that, you know, we really try in today's world to have different experts help our players, right? So you have a fitness guy, you might have a mental guy, you might have a biomechanist, you have some people a nutritionist, some people you know maybe do overlapping jobs, you obviously have your swing coach, some people even have a short game coach or just a putting coach. I mean, it could be as big, as, as small, and as crazy as different people uh, want to make it. But I do think having the right team and functioning well as a team can be really valuable to players. Um, not all players. I think some players, are, you know, their psychology is a little bit different. But for a lot of players, having the right pieces in place plays an important role. And I think it's not just their knowledge of uh, the topic, whether it be teaching, working out, therapy, you name it. Uh, it's also the chemistry and the psychology they bring to the team that plays a role. So, so I know you're a big team guy. I know obviously working with Rosie, he's a big team guy. You've got some great people on, th on that team. Talk a little bit about how important you think the team is and then how it works. Because, you know, I, what drives me crazy is when I hear certain coaches say, well, the swing coach is the most important guy. Or somebody else says, this person's the most important person. Or this mo and, and, you know, to me, it's like there's no most important person. Depends on what the yeah, issue you know, depends you know, on what the issue you know the is. The, you know <laughs> the player's the, the only one that matters. Person. The only most important person is the player. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there you go. I would any if I ever heard that said to me, I'd light someone on fire from that. Um, 
it, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, look, when, when we started in 2007 uh, on the PGA Tour, Craig Davies and I, um, like we were just a couple of kids, and we, we worked together since 2001. Um, I used to go down to Toronto and watch him treat people all day as a chiropractor, and then he would come up to the golf course on the weekends and watch me teach lessons. Then, because we were both totally broke, um, we started – putting on uh, discussions for chiros and massage therapists. I kind of went through the swing. He talked about how you would treat it. We're just doing all that stuff and uh, just trying to get better, like just period, like, but very organically, like just super organically. And uh, I mean, you know, not here we are 19 years later and we still room together every week. And, you know, his practice and therapy has gone into like a whole different world of like quantum mechanics and microcurrents and all kinds of interesting stuff. He still has incredible hands and he still uses them. But just to, you know, be basically how we started, we didn't really have a team initiative. It was just, you know, basically how sharing. we got on tours. More sharing yeah, of he ideas. Treated, <clears throat> yeah, he treated Stephen Ames at the Canadian Open told him he thought it was technical why he was hurting his back so Stephen came to see me and then that same week Craig came down and I hired Neil Smith to work with the kids at the academy uh, in Orlando on the mental stuff and the performance stuff Neil was there hurt his neck Craig treated him he said man you know he was an Olympic athlete Neil was he said uh, that was a great treatment called Hunter Mahan Davies flew to see Dallas next thing you know you know within a year and a half, him and I have four players in the top 55 in the world that we're working together with. Um, and we're scanning them, you know, just like we always did. Um, so it wasn't, none of it was on purpose. It's like, and it never is. Um, it was just two curious people who were passionate about movement. Myself, obviously more about golf. Uh, Craig played like tons of sports, but, um, not really ever golf. Uh, and then that's how it began. And then as time has went on, you know, it's become this whole massive industry. And I mean, it, it's fascinating to watch a player surrounded. The danger with the whole thing, Ben, is that these players, most of them got to where they got like within their own thoughts and their own understandings. Um, sure. And and now everyone, everyone probably technically knows how to help them get better. But it's yeah it's just it's really really interesting um and then i think what happens too is i forget where i read it or who told me it but the one great quote that i'd heard on like teams and stuff was that when what was the quote i'll never forget it i hope i haven't forgot it oh when when a team caters to talent over uh character and integrity they lose their culture and so for me you know, the idea in a team of staying in your lane, you you would not have any of my caddies that I've worked with with my players call in right now and ever hear them say that they'd heard me second guess anything they've done, any club they picked, anything like that. Um, you would never hear me come in and look at the trainer and say, you know, I'm not sure about that right there. Look, you, Kevin Duffy, all the people I've been around, are so far past what I understand The taking a two day seminar. Remember life is full of people who think they know a lot Ben, because they've taken five, two day seminars. I mean, how <laughs> scary is that? Yeah, that's, that's the scary. That's the scariest shit ever, by the way. Okay. So to me, it's like, you know, I hung out with David or I thought I didn't know there was that much to do with putting and short game, but I thought David knew some good stuff. I, I liked him as a professional. Uh, you know, he didn't sleep. He's studying this stuff so much. Uh, we, Justin Rose is kind of struggling. And I say, hey, maybe we should have a look at what my friend David Orr has to say. Uh, it was a great relationship. It's, it is no longer like many relationships. Um, but it was an advantage. It was beneficial to everyone aligned with it. Um, I've never really been big on the whole mental thing because I, I think what happens to players, to be honest with you, can be a little more environmental. Um, I think the way that we practice gives us a false sense of competence. Um, 
Yeah, the, the whole mental thing, I, I don't know. Basically, I think if you're not making it really hard when you're practicing, then you're not doing it right. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think the mental part is the hardest because it's hard to quantify, right, and just actually say. Yeah, but what is, but, but what is, what does the mental part mean, though, dude? Because to me, when I think of, like, people who have, like, a mental thing, um, I think more of, like, schizophrenia and bipolarity. I think of, like, chemically, like, altered states in the brain's function. I don't think of, like someone who makes a double bogey and has no perspective on life. Yeah. Like I think that most of that stuff, if you dug back and I have friends with a lot of PhDs and different people and have talked to tons of people and you know, that at the end of the day, anybody's psychological stuff is usually just driven more on clinical psychology, just who they are as a person, much more so than anything to do with golf. Like the golf, sure. the, go the golf is just a byproduct of the fundamental psychological state that they exist within yeah i think psychology in a lot of situations is necessary when uh, philosophies fail when virtues and ethics and value systems fail um so anyways yeah i yeah. I, I just think you know from a strength and conditioning standpoint when i first got on tour guys would get done and they would all come back to the range. I don't see that as much anymore. I see guys going to see their trainer or going to get treatment. Um, I think the biggest, the biggest change I've seen, how we've become more like the rest of the sports world, I think recovery has become more of a focus. Um, you know, like Dr. Ara out there as a medical doctor, um, you know, mapping what guys are eating and how it's affecting them, looking at testosterone and cortisol levels. Um, you know, our idea of like a guy struggling needs to work harder. I mean, if his cortisol is high and his testosterone's low, it's not a very good idea. No, no doubt. I think some of that stuff is good, and I think we've also gone too far with some of that. Because, like you said, a lot. I of, agree. A lot well, of these guys have Nicholas gotten good on their own. Like I thought, I measure with my players. We do measure all kinds of readiness scores and use various technologies to measure what they're doing. And, you know, my fear always in that is if they have the information, if they wake up and readiness is low, they're going to feel like, oh, my God, I can't play. And I always like to remind them what a good job we're doing. I'm like, look, if we go back to your time in college, I'm sure there were days where you had a pepperoni pizza, 10 beers, woke up the next day, carried your bag and shot 65. Like, let's not, like, oh, let, let's not and, use and, this as a crutch. A Coke. Correct. Uh, while you were playing, eating at Snickers bar. Like, let's not go that far. Like, yes, it's about patterns and things that happen over time. And I think our ability to measure and track and do that stuff. But, I mean, I see guys getting treated twice a day. I mean, I see guys, like, they become so hypersensitive to any little thing. And they're like, oh, this oh. little thing hurts there. If, you, if they knew what a normal person even felt like. They would be like, oh, my God, I, I literally need to, can't get out of bed for a month because the littlest thing has them spun out of control. So, you know, it's a fine balance. Yeah, no, and no. It's valuable, but, but it's a but, fine but, balance. Yeah, but that's the other thing, though, too, you know, about what some of these teams end up kind of creating. It's like, you know, someone goes to a therapist and say they were whatever, you know, bullied as a kid, and they say, tell me about it. I mean, why? Fuck, it's 20 years ago. Like, <laughs> the, the, my, do you know what I mean? Like, you got so here. You got here. <laughs> So th there's a level of codependency that ends up being generated by this. And, oh, yeah, no, 100%. That, I mean, I'm not going to really probably see that on on the teams that I'm around. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I see some interesting – I see some interesting things. I, I just, you know – I'll give you an example, right? Like I had a player one time, and they were the, – the, the people were talking about, you know, the effect that – the, the dad it had on the kid and, and, and how that's why he struggles and blah, 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 blah. And that's where he's at. And, you know, it's old stuff that's come back to roost and da, 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 da. And, and I said, well, this player was eighth in the world a year and a half ago. And they said, yeah. And I said, so wasn't their past the same then? Like, I don't understand where you're getting at here. I think this is like, this is just going in circles leading nowhere. Like the, the, the thing is, is we have to, we have to understand like that stuff has also made players really, really strong and really, really tough. And I think overall, I mean, if you look at society currently, um, we've probably been as soft as we've ever been. We're scared of everything. I mean, everything. Um, 
Yeah, yeah it's I interesting. I think that's an interesting thing. I mean, I'm good friends with Mike Gervais. I don't know if people know Mike Gervais is. Mike's a, one of the, probably the top sports uh, mental guys in the world. I mean, he worked with the, uh, Keith Baumgartner, the guy who jumped out of that s- out of the plane and broke the sound the sound barrier in free fall with, in a project with NASA and Red Bull Sports. Um, he, he works with the cr- like people doing life and death stuff, not you know, hey, put the ball in the hole. Yeah, that's a whole. That, that's, that's a whole right. A, that's and a I whole always talk different. to him. I always talk to him about like, and, you, and he has a podcast called Finding Mastery, which is unbelievable. Um, I think the I best the best podcast out there, and he's got people who are from athletes to business leaders to environmental people to military to just people doing extraordinary things. And, you know, one of the things as you go through it with him, and I texted him, you know, recently and said, look, man, I love the, the stuff that you're doing. It just seems like everybody who does this incredible stuff actually had big traumas, right? And I said, is great, yeah. is, is big trauma almost prerequisite to greatness? And he said, laughingly, he goes, it kind of is. 100%. 100%. Right. 100%. It's just how you handle it. Some people know how to deal with it, and some people don't. And I think in your example, in the golf example, look, that person obviously has the capacity to handle it if they were eighth in the world. And they did use it as a positive. Yeah, yeah, of course. So that, that's, mm-hmm. what, that's what I'm talking about. It's like, yeah, it, it's just the whole – I get it. I mean, who didn't want to grow up and have a perfect relationship with your dad? Well, I mean, what world do you live on? I mean, the, <laughs> you know – I had a player last week. He was complaining about a couple of things, and we're at the Players' Championship. And I said, hey, you're not one of those guys who think that life's supposed to be fair, are you? Right. And you're there playing at the Players' like, Championship. It's unfair. For you, you're already unfairly in the advantage compared to the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. So, it's yeah, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh, I said, look, if that's the case, then no wonder, no, no wonder dude's fair. What does that even mean? So I think that that's what I mean by – I'll never get into that place in my mind because philosophically I've read enough and thought enough to understand that this is not fair. So it's not like I need to go and sit on a couch and talk to someone about it every week. I just know it's not fair. I'm going to make the most of it while I can. Um, and you know what, what else is, what, what else am I going to be able to do? I mean, if you really just thought about what was essential, so what's essential, right? Uh, water, food, shelter, sunlight some money love that might I mean, be it. Ex- <laughs> exercise i mean so even at a time that's difficult like this i mean i bet you a lot of people have all that yeah i mean so I... the only the only you know the only reason they're upset is because they can't go about doing what wasn't essential you see what i'm saying like sure. what's essential so yeah, of course. Do I like going to golf tournaments and working with my guys that I love and watching them play? And do I love the whole thing? Of course. Um, will I miss that for some time? Sure. Now, have I ever had an opportunity to spend as much time as I will with my wife and my son since they've been born? No. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the best. I, I'm gonna do the best with the situation. That is what it is. That's the only way. You have no control over the situation. You do, however, have some influence on your estimate of it. And how you handle it, whatever it may be. It doesn't matter what the outcome yeah, is. Yeah, so, I mean, how like, you if, manage I told it, a 15, to you. if I told a 15-year-old player that, and that's all they ever thought about, I don't see how far off they could get. It's like it could lead them into some, like, really deep insights that would carry them through the difficult times. I mean, look, I, I never want to go on a boat with a with a boat captain who learned to sail in, like, calm seas. <laughs> be tough. Yeah, I'm I mean, what's going to happen when those waves start going? But I need a guy who's been on the biggest waves. Yeah, because odds are when I go out, the waves are going to be rough. It's, uh, yeah, look, I mean, it's all so intertwined. Like we said, the human element and how you are as a human dramatically is affecting how you play, how you perform, the scores you shoot, how you improve or don't improve or <laughs> whatever the case may be. Is all interesting. Dude, how 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 many rounds have been ruined by a player teeing off, realizing that his daughter's first dance recital is today, and he's not going to be there? I mean, come on, yeah, all but, the time. And this is the stuff the public doesn't understand, right? And they, oh, why the guy's playing like crap, or why did he play so badly today? They're, you know, you and I know because we're behind the scenes, but how often like little things that are going on behind the scenes. And again, it's not like they go out and shoot 95. They still go out and shoot 73 or whatever it is. It's like, that's still pretty, really good golf. (laughs) Which 
Which isn't good enough. <laughs> right, right. So, but still, like, really good golf. On really hard golf courses, right? They still go out and shoot 73, and they're like, okay, well, now I'm eight back. You know, or whatever already. And it's like, people are like, oh, what's wrong with that guy? It's like, man, you know, the, the line is so fine at the highest level, right? That's the part that oh. people cannot grasp. How fine that line is between a hundredth and a, you know first and one hundred fiftieth is nothing, you know. It just oh, it's 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 right. You can't you can hardly put your finger on it. Correct. So let's do this. We're gonna grab one more break, and then when we come back, I'm gonna just do some rapid fire questions. I had some people send in some questions they'd wanna kind of ask you. We can wrap up, rapid fire some questions, and then we'll wrap it up and let you get about uh, spending some time with that wife and family. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ben Shear, PGA Tour trainer, Golf Digest Fitness Advisor, and host of the Golfer's Edge on Sirius XM PGA Tour Radio. So when I first saw these sticks, I knew I had to get involved. Three huge benefits from this type of program. Number one, it's going to allow us to get our club and our body in positions to have a consistent, efficient, and effective golf swing. Number two, it's going to reduce our risk of injuries. And number three, the big thing everyone is looking for, it's going to allow us to hit the ball that much further. Welcome back, Ben Shear here with my man, Sean Foley. And for this last segment here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a little rapid fire question things. I don't know how rapid fire we can get with Foles because he's, you know, he's got some insight into all these things, but we're gonna, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna see how we can go, but I want him to be himself because then without that, it's not- Don't, don't, worry, don't worry about no, that. no value That's without that. Happen. So this question, actually, the first question comes from me personally, and I'm gonna say, who are the three most influential people in your teaching? And what is the one most important thing you learned from them? Oh, the three most imp influential people in my teaching? Yeah. And the probably one, be, and say again? And the one most important thing you learned from them? Uh, the first would be, uh, the first would be Ben Kern. Okay. Uh, ben Kern. Ben Kern was a Canadian professional um, who uh, was one of our first really good players on the PGA Tour. Uh, first Canadian to be a uh, first team All American, and was best friends with George Knudsen. Um, ben brought me into his program at the National Golf and Country Club, which is Canada. That's like our Pine Valley. Yep. Uh, and put put me in the junior program, which meant from like one till three every day we had to fix divots. Um, and that's where our best players in the province were all practicing and stuff. So I, I would say Ben for sure. Uh, one, how his influence was just, he just showed me what it was like to be a pro. Nice. Just, you know, we talk about Bob Ford and everyone calls him pro. Yeah, pro's pro. That's Ben. I mean, it's couldn't be, it's the same. Oh, it's almost the same man. Almost. I actually get goosebumps and trip out a little bit when I'm around Bob Ford because yeah. it's, it's eerie to me how similar it is. Um, Second, I mean, I, I probably would have to say David Ledbetter. Um, and, and what I mean by that is in the sense of like, you know, this guy pioneered um, what is now my career. Um, sure. He made teaching golf a profession. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, he, whether I agree or disagree with what he coaches or whatever, that, that's beside the point. Um, you know, to anyone who disses him, I didn't see them help two players get to number one in the world. So, I mean, I get it. it it's, and and it's anybody who's making a living teaching golf right now owes him a debt of gratitude. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Just like the people, whether you stuff. like Tiger or not, if you're playing on the tour and you're making all this money, well, you wouldn't be without Tiger, right? It's like everybody, oh, yeah. you got to thank Tiger for that. And as a teacher, you got to thank Led. Thank Led. Yeah, one one hundred percent. And then I would probably say third would be uh, Craig Davies because he was the one who really got me to go down the rabbit hole of like human movement, um, which I think has been just such an absolute fifteenth club in my in my coaching. Um, and you know, because I don't really from social media to all that stuff, I don't have any of that it's still semi a mystery of what it is that I actually think about, but it's, you know, that, that's a big part of it. So, um, understanding you know, how body show, function affects how the golf swing works, basically. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I think 
you know, I think all the stuff as far as like forces into the grip, that's right up there. Um, I owe Sasho McKenzie a great debt of gratitude, but to be honest with you in 2001, um, people in Canadian golf, when they started criticizing me, I mean, I literally have been criticized since day one. And I, I think for everyone out there coaching, you want that, um, is my kids, uh, had too much of a drop to being too flat in transition and their left wrist wasn't cupped enough. So it's not like I didn't have 140 people on the wait list because I understood that a flex left wrist best based on grip and a club getting the center mass behind the club in transition, like watching Hogan and all my heroes, they all did that. So I was like, all right. So I used to get everyone, I mean, everyone to flatten the shaft as much as they could in transition. Uh, and then at that time too, it was like pretty much a center pivot, which is some of the stuff that I learned from Ernest Jones. Cause he came back with only a left leg from the war and I could literally flush balls off my left leg. Uh, and then diving a little bit into more add in max stuff, um, which a lot of it, I still see, uh, in my head, but I understand through human movement, like what he thought he was doing and what he was actually doing aren't, aren't totally, you know, they're not parallel. Um, so that would be, that would probably be the, those would be the three. Okay, perfect. I've uh, actually, I've actually, I've actually never even thought about that. That's cool, and that's a good question. Uh, so this guy's name, this is from Leighton Peevler. I don't know if you know who that is. I don't, but that's okay. I like this question because I didn't obviously pick everybody's question. I liked his. He says, in instruction, there are preferences, things we like to see, and principles, things everyone likes to see. What is your favorite preference? And principle. Yeah, I like that. It's a good um, question. I don't know. Can I be at a place where I don't have preferences anymore? I, I don't know. You, that's, that's only for you to answer, my man. Yeah, no, I honestly, like, yeah. I, I mean, of course, like, the vision, if, if there's one swing I've watched more than any swing ever, it's Ben Hogan. Um, Justin Rose probably at this he, point. <laughs> does he does he keep this Ben Hogan set up in good posture? Yes. Does he keep his diaphragm left a long time in the takeaway as his left arm goes into adduction? Yes. Um, does he create does he create like a beautiful stretch phase to the top that's then led by a massive counter rotation phase into an extension phase? Yes. Is, that's now a principle, bud. That's not a preference. So you, you see what I'm saying? Like to me, I'm watching Dak Prescott, Dak Prescott going down the field in warmups, basically looking like Ben Hogan in transition. So, um, I, yeah, I, I think that rotations always been more that way. I think when we see guys, get really opened up over time they've done it by i think being in counter rotation phase getting the rib cage away from the pec in transition creating that oblique sling and then using an extension phase to keep the pelvis moving uh i don't i don't really think it's as like squat and rotate uh that's not it's an option it's it's a, it's a it's a it's another choice but you know what when you talk about the preferences um, versus the principles, the principles uh, is ground reaction force is a principle. I don't know. It's a reactive force. It's reacting to something. Um, well, is it, it's you know a Newtonian I mean? so law, so I would have to say it's a principle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I understand. I understand it's a Newtonian law, but my point is, is like, so. But what would specifically should the pattern be, I guess, is the, is the question, right? Well, it's, I mean, that's going to, that, it, look, if, 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 if my, like a second baseman, right, sits there and he dives to catch the ball, like it's seventh inning, boom, 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 ball gets hit, he makes an unbelievable diving save, and then someone says, look at how much linear and vertical force he put into the ground, but all he was trying to do was catch it. For sure. So. I'm, I'm more a hands guy than a body guy in the sense that I'm, I'm a body guy in the sense that I want a guy to come in and see Ben or Kevin Duffy and learn how to breathe properly and learn how to be in flexion and be in all these places so that when his hands have this intention of doing these great things, the body is there to support and aid and help 
generate, you know, power and all that. Yeah. But to me, to me, if I cut off a player's legs, he can hit the ball still decent. If I cut off his hands, it's like, what's he going to do? Tough. Very, like, mm-hmm. really hard to. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've worked at some, I've worked at some of those. I've, I've done some stuff with wounded warriors and, you know, a single arm amputation, there's a way around it. The double, those, it's not really that way. Whereas there's so many guys with single leg amputations or both leg amputations who can just hit it 300 yards in the air. So is it really kind of more of a sling and a diaphragm and rib cage movement of the torso with the arms? I mean, a golf club is really not that heavy for a grown man. It's probably like, you know, Sasho talks about probably closer to a badminton racket. So I think all the gains that I can get from a ground reaction force is going to come from all the time I spend with you and your gym mate. I just, I'm not going to be able to like force is force. Like you cannot have movement without a force preceding it. So if you were to take me in the gym and really improve my mobility and then really improve my strength, then that's not going to, that's how I'm going to improve that. I'm not going to sit on the range and, 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 and be able to do a ton if I can't, make myself more able so yeah, yeah you, you have a, you have a capacity limit based on your physical ability right so the whatever your however full your bucket is that's the best you're going to be and then if you get a bigger bucket then your, your capacity gets you know your ability improves you know that's right that's but what can the we, gym could, is doing. Could, could we say as a principle that everyone who creates more left leg vertical force hit it further i don't think you can say that no i don't so, i don't think so do, do you know what i mean so it's like it's tricky because <clears throat> We're still, for most, like most of us aren't like you and Craig and those guys who are on a next scientific level. Your brains work very well that way. You see that stuff very well. I mean, we're basically golf coaches who love golf. um, And some are very sharp individuals and some are very intuitive individuals. There's all sorts, just like there would be in a high school cafeteria. Um, But I still think like sometimes we're just a little bit out of our pay grade on it and then we feel the need to go and learn all this stuff so we can be kind of avant-garde and be with the times. But like we haven't even looked at the asymmetry in the human torso before we're telling people about like stretch shorten cycles and stuff. Like it's just crazy. Like the shit that I hear being talked about, I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, like if Ben or Davies or Dr. Brendan or any of those guys were in that room, those guys would be torched. I mean, flamethrower style. And they get up and give a speech to 200 people at a PGA, uh, at a PGA section speech. And I'm just kind of like, oh man, all those people, a lot of those people are just going to go and start teaching that. Like, man, you have a responsibility. Like as golf instructors, we have the ability to charge like a very good hourly wage. And sometimes it's like incredible. It's almost like, a wage that you would see on wall street for a corporate lawyer. Um, but we can't really point to like an eight year degree and a master's and a PhD. Like we can't. Nope. Um, so like I always say to my friends, I hope you guys are right. Cause I use this stuff all the time. <laughs> exactly. All right, let's move on to the next question. Bottom line is, who knows preferences or principles? I don't know what to tell you. Well, well, no, no, it's not who knows. I mean, the principles is like, of, of course, when you're dealing with forces and torques into a golf club, um, you're going to be opening and closing faces. You're going to be dumping velocity, and you're going to be maintaining it. You're going to have more angular yeah. acceleration. And, and but, or a, you but won't. a lot of different impact alignments can create good shots at the end of the day, right? So to say this only is the only way to do it. I can hit draws. I can hit fades. I can hit it low. I can hit it high. I can do all these things, and all those you know, things. You know what? I, I would say I, I, I'm probably way more clear on what's wrong than what's right. I'd probably okay. leave it at that. Okay. I like that. I'm very, cl- I'm, I'm very clear on what's wrong. That, <laughs> I, I like that. that I, look, that, that might be more important if you can just, because the possibilities of what's right is probably going to continue to expand. But if we can start eliminating certain things, that's equally, if not more valuable. So I think that's great. Well, because just because I spent so much time with you guys, when someone's like, got to get the center of mass behind and i'm looking at someone's thoracic rotation or how their neck moves or their shoulder even their forearm i'm going yeah it's a principle but but does it apply to this guy like again and i think that and and everything in our world needs to start becoming n of one and the problem is we like to study groups 
and the group then they say the average this or the average that and the problem is the average do doesn't matter to the individual standing in front of you because they have nothing to do with that average and their specific physiology or history or what injury past you name it all plays a role in where they are in that moment and the average of any group doesn't be any good if i took an average of you know all tour players and how they moved and then I told Jason Day he should be more like Bubba Watson, and Bubba Watson he should be more like Jason Day. I'd probably make both of them worse. Oh, guaranteed. <laughs> right. So I mean, it doesn't the, moving to the average and saying the average player does this, the average tour player, the average whatever, is the dumbest thing that we do, in my opinion, in in this whole scientific community. Like I get why we do it, but I just having done this, I've been working on tour since 1998. I mean, a long, long time. I, I just don't see that stuff apply across the board and be consistent. Not saying it never does, but just not always. And, and you can't go in thinking average is a good thing. Yeah, no, I'm with you 100%. <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, Jason Bale, I'm sure you know Jason Bale. I know Jason Bale, super smart guy. Uh, yeah, nice, nice guy. Super guy. So he says, having been in the spotlight for the last 10 years, um, uh -huh. what – what advice could you share with a teacher, a young, smart, up-and-coming teacher who's looking to hopefully one day, let's not say walk in your shoes, but be teaching on tour or whatever you want, however you want to call it? What, what would be the one thing you'd like to share with those guys if this is their goal? Yeah, I think, how, how did I get into it? So basically, I started teaching golf because it was like pretty much the only option. No one would hire me for sure. Um, so I, I started teaching golf at John Jacobs Golf Schools. Obviously, growing up, there was focus in the golfing machine, so I was kind of always into that. thought that was really interesting. Love, just love. I mean, dude, hitting a four iron from 220 up in the air through the wind to three feet is just, I'm sorry, like a three-pointer doesn't do it for me. That does it for <laughs> me. That is so, that's so crazy, right? Like watching Cameron Champ get up and hit, and hit it 340 over a bunker and not curve it. It's like just such a miracle of engineering. Yeah, so it's I, a passion just, for you. It's your passion. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. But you know, I, I, I love it, but I'm, I'm like right there with hip hop. I just never figured out how to make it a career. Um, so I would say like, I was probably driven by insecurity, materialism to be good. Uh, you know, when I was younger, you know, I, they, we, they gr we grow up and they just shove down our throats what success is. Um, so obviously I fell victim to uh, to that misinterpretation. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, it's not easy. I mean, it's I love that I love how hard it is. And I think in the time I've been out there in 12 years, man, it's been it's been a turnstile of coaches because you know you gotta go through it to get to it, and you gotta be pretty thick. Um, in your skin. You can't take anything personally. It's just business to me, right? Like, I love my guys, but at the end of the day, it's a business. Um, I'm not going to travel all over the world just because I love my guys and, 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 and leave my family. So, you know, it's, it's all that. It's all the criticism um, that you get. Uh, obviously, I'm responsible for the criticism that I got because in 2010, um, I decided to coach Tiger, who I think you'd have to be a fool if you didn't realize that he was diminished um, and knew that I would always be compared uh, to his greatest era. And, you know, I mean, I took a beating on a daily basis. To be honest with you, I can't really say that it, I think you could even talk to people who know me and it didn't really bother me because, like I said, dude, until I walk a mile in Ben's shoes, I don't know what Ben goes through. I don't know what you go through. So when people ask me about someone, I'm like, I don't know. I don't really know. Yeah, but you hung out with him twice. I'm like, it doesn't mean I know them. I Basically, you hang out with someone twice in a lot of cases because people are very protected. They're just going to show you that side or whatever. So you don't really know what people go through. Um, so yeah, I, I remember being in your house when you were working with Tiger and – we were talking about something and you were just like, look, I know there's issues, whatever, but he's like, as a teacher, he's the greatest player who ever played. And how could you not want to see what you can do and take that opportunity? It's just an opportunity to try to see what you can do. And it's a special moment. And whether it's going to work out or not, you shouldn't have fear of it. 
and I thought that was a pretty yeah, cool no, way no, of it, thinking about it. No, nah, look, man. I mean, like, gosh, dude, this. I mean, there's like 2.7 million people in a Syrian refugee camp right now. I mean, I'm I just I'm struggling right now with some of my friends who are woe is me, and I'm just like, guys, there are a billion different people out there where they're really really affected like you're just affected from your selfish life this is like a this is a serious thing like oh so you can't go to you can't go to soul cycle like fuck i'm sorry you know what i mean like um any any anyways i so i would just say to jason who i know and who i really like um it is you know it, it, well he's i mean he's probably my age i think but as far as young guys going out there, I mean, you know, I wouldn't say do it for the right reasons because when I first started doing it, I wasn't really – I loved the game and I loved coaching and all that. But I wanted to be on the front cover of Golf Digest, all that stuff I laugh at now. Um, you know, I wanted, I wanted that to be me. Um, I can admit all that stuff. I mean, it, hey, Look, I mean, I, when I started, people asked me the same question. And, you know, trainer, young trainers will call up and say, hey, how – you know, whatever. And, I, you know, I said, like – First of all, like I said, I started in 1990. I started being a trainer in 1991 and started in well, tour in 1990. You were like a witch doctor. Yeah. Like, you're, so you're a, I tell people, I'm like, look, I actually had no idea I was going to end up here. I had no plan to be here. I never even thought about being here. I wasn't a golf guy growing up. Um, I, I was a guy who wanted to train athletes. I had some athletes I was working with. And within that, I was like, well, there's not enough pro athletes around here to make a living. There was not enough, you know, uh, college guys because they were only home on the summer. So I had a bunch of high school kids, and I was like, well, I can't make money by only working half a day. So I said, like, what people I don't, you know, I didn't want to just work with general fitness. I was like, what type of people who are regular people who are around every day who have an actual, like, functional sporting goal? And it turned out to be golfers. And then I started looking at the science that was in there, and it was fascinating. I was like, wow, there's some really cool stuff about golf. There's, you know, it's an interesting sport. There's actually like 3D data. We have really cool information. And I, as a science-minded guy, I had a passion for it. I started digging in and digging in, and I started calling people and connecting with people. And so what I, would t what I tell people the same thing is like, look, I didn't go in with that being the end game. It doesn't mean you can't. But my thing was I had a passion for what I did, and my only goal was to be the best I could be at what I did. And it led me there. It wasn't my purpose. And I think if your purpose is to get there and you think that you can bypass the fundamentals of truly being the best you can be at your craft, then you're going to fall short. That you know, yeah. let, let that part be far, first and foremost in what you do. Yeah, 100%. I mean, look, I, I was like, I was like, gosh, I was in love with Davis Love, the, the junior and 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 David Ledbetter and Butch Harmon. So there there there's probably all, my dad would probably answer that different. My dad would probably say that he could have never seen me doing anything different, uh, like that he would have completely saw me doing that. Uh, but I would I would say that I really wanted to do it, but it was driven more by uh, it was it was driven. I I mean how how much of success is driven by insecurity? I mean probably a lot, right? Like I mean wow. I'll I mean, check that box. <laughs> you know, I mean, how, how many, you know, how many guys are billionaires now just have been running from the fact they were broke when they were little? I mean, and now they got more than enough and they still someone has more. So, um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's you a know, big they, part they, of it. that's a big part of it. And that's cool. I mean, you know, everyone would be Own freer it. and everyone would be freer in the world if they were secure about their insecurities. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't I had no insecurities until I started to have cognition and socialization. I've never seen a two year old kid who needs to see a therapist over their over, over their positivity issues you know what i mean no for sure awesome we all right we start pretty good yeah awesome i'm gonna wrap it up there i had a bunch more questions but due to time i'm gonna wrap it up there maybe i'll have you back on again soon but i appreciate it falls as always pleasure, bro. Uh, hopefully i'll see you back out there soon uh stay safe enjoy the family and uh i really really appreciate it Thanks for listening. Please give us a follow on social and check out our website at www.bensheargolf.com for all of our programs and products. Also, be on the lookout for our next episode as we continue to discuss the best of everything golf before.